coming. Um, this was made possible by Rysdale College and Hawkins Educational Trust, which does a lot of work with uh, students and teachers um, trying to spread the lessons of the Holocaust and trying to ensure that the education carries on through generations. Uh, Marla has been through the Average Programme, which is where survivors such as Marla come to establishments to talk about their experiences and again just to try and carry on education for the rest of the generations. Um, Marla, I hope everybody give her a very warm welcome, Marla Trich. Um, I want to start by showing you where I come from. So you see in front of you the map of Poland between the two world wars. Um, now the, the dot on the right is Warsaw, the capital. Uh, the next one down is Piotrków, it's the town I come from. And the one lower down is Częstochowa, which is very significant in my story. <coughs> But I'll tell you about it as I come to it. It's a very, very sad story. I um, mean, this particular incident. And uh, the next one is Krakow. Now, I, Krakow is a beautiful Polish city. And um, the reason I'm just pointing it out is because it, it is very well known now for the infamous concentration camp Auschwitz. So I thought I'd just point that out. And on the left is Berlin, uh, so over the border. Uh, this is just a very old picture of the town square. It's probably 100 years ago. And this is another side of it. This is the town hall as it is now. Um, there, and this is the park that I visited. Well, the park in my town, it, it's where I spent my early years with my siblings, my friends, my parents. Uh, and I visited just the sort of be be beginning of the spring, so it looks rather bare. This is the hospital where I was born in, it's another side of it. And this is the school I went to. Now, before I go on, has this been really switched on? Uh, can you all hear me? You can, okay, great. Now, this school has been changed. It is now a school for children with learning difficulties, and it's been renamed the Janusz Korczak School. Now, has anybody heard of Janusz Korczak? Wonderful, because I don't often get that when I speak to younger people, but um, it's, he's really worth knowing about. Uh, now, he was a very special man. He lived at the beginning of the last century. He was a pediatrician, and he was very interested in children, but not only their medical conditions. He was interested in children's rights. It's something that was totally unknown in those days. And so he was in the forefront of that fight for children and their rights. He thought children were important. They shouldn't just be seen and not heard. They should certainly be heard. They've got a lot to say. They're intelligent. They can make a contribution. And, and he encouraged children to speak and to, to, to think. So he, he was really very, very interested in children. So he was well known for that. He had written a lot of textbook on it as well. But what he was better known for is that during the, the war, he was um, in charge of a children's home, uh, an orphanage in the Warsaw Ghetto. And when the ghetto was going to be liquidated and everybody was going to be deported to their deaths, the Germans actually told him that he can stay be behind it. They didn't want to get rid of him. But he declined that offer. And he went with the children into the gas chambers. So ultimately, he gave his life for children. And I'm very proud that my school is named after him. Now, the next slide is the synagogue, which before the war was a very beautiful building, but as soon as the Germans invaded, they started using it as stables and it became very dilapidated. 
But that synagogue <coughs> has a special and very tragic significance for me, and I'll tell you about it as I come to it in sequence. Because to start at the beginning, I, uh, you saw the town I was born in, and before the war I had a very ordinary life of that period. Um, I, I did all the usual things. I went to school, I uh, had friends, I had relatives, I, I had the usual tea parties and playing games and really just a normal life. But on the 1st of September 1939, war broke out and my life turned upside down. Our town was the first to have a ghetto, and I'm sure you all probably know what a ghetto is. Now, I didn't point out to you that my town was not all that far from the German border. And that part between the German, the German border and our town, that was immediately annexed. And it was made part of the, the Reich. Um, and they wanted, obviously, obviously, to make it Judenrein, which means free of Jews. And those, the Jews there immediately started leaving, but a lot of them were officially deported so further east. And a lot of them uh, ended up in our town. Now, our town had a population of 55,000, of which um, 15,000 were Jews. But because of that enormous influx from, from the surrounding places that became part of Germany, part of Greater Germany, um, this created, you know, this enlarged our ghetto, and not, not in physical terms, not, not to, in size, it was a very small area that housed. Um, well, during the war, the, all the Jews had to move, uh, move in. The, the Christians had to move out, the Jews had to move into this small area where these 15,000 Jews um, were forced to live. But at its height, the ghetto increased to 28,000 because of all those extra people, the influx from this, this um, area that had now become part of Germany. Now, when war broke out, I was um, still eight, I was approaching my nine's birthday, and of course school stopped immediately. It was the 1st of September, we were due to go back to school, but that never happened. Jewish children had no more education. Um, the ghetto was very heavily guarded. It, it wasn't at first, um, didn't have any barbed wire around it, but that came later. But uh, we were not allowed in or out of the ghetto. The, even within the ghetto, there were curfews who were not allowed out on the, the streets um, after 8 o'clock in the evening. Um, there was, because of the great overcrowding, um, and, and there could be as many as 10 people to a room, or three families, two or three families to a room, the overcrowding w was really terrible. Um, and the inadequate sanitary conditions caused a lot of epidemics, and people were dying from that. But also there were constant roundups, and people were being deported or just killed or just taken away and shot. Um, life became very restricted and of course they were constantly depriving us of our, of, of our possessions. So you, the kind of notices used to go up on the ghetto walls saying what we should hand in and where, by what time and so on and what date. Um, food was very short and um, there was only one section of the population that, that had any chance of survival and that was the middle section, say between about 18 and 40. They were not interested in children, 
all old people. So they were the most vulnerable. But even people who had working permits, who had jobs, they weren't safe either. Nobody was really safe. Um, there was one particular German officer called William who was in charge of the ghetto. <coughs> but were, the, the ghetto was always patrolled by the, the, the German um, uh, soldiers with rifles and they could just shoot anybody on sight if they didn't like the look of one person. Um, but this William used to come round, um, not quite as often as the others, but when he came, he always had a big black dog with him. And that dog was actually trained to attack people in the most horrific way. Um, and I, I remember that if I saw him just from a distance with that dog, I used to just disappear very quickly. And I mean that applied to a lot of uh, other people, adults too. It, it was a very threatening occasion, but, but the whole life in the ghetto was threatening. I didn't mention to you that um, people over the age of 12 had to wear a white armband with a blue star of David on it, and if you're caught without it, um, well, you could be shot. You could be shot for any anything. Um, Life went on with the get it was in the ghetto um, for about two and a half years with, with all the shortages and restrictions and, and deaths and deportations and constant roundups. But after about two and a half years, rumors started circulating that the ghetto is going to be liquidated and everybody's going to be deported except people who had working permits. So some people started making arrangements for themselves to, um, to somehow avoid the deportations because we knew what the deportations meant. It would, well, it wasn't going to be to labor camps, it was going to be to, to annihilation camps. Um, there were possibilities of somehow avoiding the deportations, but they were not easy and, and they were very, could be very expensive. Some people managed to um, just smuggle themselves out and live outside in the open or, or in sewers or in the forests or um, anywhere out of sight, uh, out of the ghetto. But some people had friends outside who perhaps would hide one or two people of a family. Some people were doing it just for money, it was a business. And it could be a very lucrative business. But of course these people were also risking their lives because if they were caught, they, they would in all probability be shot. But some people did do it for money. Now, my parents found someone who was, someone actually they didn't find him, he was recommended. <coughs> in another town that I pointed out to you, practically on the German border, called Chosterhofer. And this family was willing to take a couple of Jewish children um, to, during the deportations, but that was for money. That was purely a business arrangement. They weren't friends of ours, they were just recommended. And they were not only Christians <coughs> and, um, and Poles, but they were actually of a, a ethnic, German ethnic origin. So we were to be even safer with them than the normal, the ordinary Pole because they enjoyed a lot of privileges that others did. And arrangements were made. They were paid, they came to pick us up. There was a man and his sister-in-law. Uh, and I won't go into details because smuggling people in and out of the ghetto was not only dangerous, but it was dangerous, but if you managed to do it, it could be very expensive, 
by bribing a guard or perhaps through some special hole that somebody has dug to, to smuggle themselves in. Um, but these people came, I still remember the, the meeting around the um, table and they were paid. Now, th this arrangement was made for me by my parents and also by my aunt and uncle, the cousins, <coughs> for their daughter Ija. And the two of us were um, to leave Piotrkov and live in Transahova um, during the deportations and we were supposed to be um, <coughs> relatives who had come to stay for a little while, relatives from Warsaw. And as you can imagine, the reason it, it was Warsaw and not Piotrkov was because it's much more difficult to, to recognize people from a large town than from a small town. So we were taken one at a time, um, a week apart, because it would have been too dangerous to have two Jewish children on false papers um, traveling at the same time. And when I say two, two Jewish children, or neither of us look Jewish, whatever the perception is, but you know, even if you're blonde and blue-eyed, and you know, they can't tell. First of all, our papers were, were false, so they could have been detected. But quite apart from that, there's one thing you cannot hide, and that's fear. And the two of us were so scared. We were leaving our families, our homes. My cousin was uh, 10 and I was 11. And well, we, found, we went by train, we found ourselves in this house on the outskirts, which was the, these were the parents in law of the men who came to collect us. He lived with his wife um, somewhere else, um, around the corner. His wife and the child, and they were small child. Um, well, we arrived there, and these people, a uh, middle-aged couple, they, um, they weren't exactly thrilled to have us, but they tolerated us, and they were okay. But we were very scared. We were very vulnerable. We were homesick. We were lonely. We really were, were very, very in quite a state over it. We tried not to let it be seen, but um, for instance, sometimes if there was a knock on the door, we would be um, bundled up somewhere out of, or out of sight, under the bed in a cupboard, anywhere out of sight. Other times it was um, safe to, to mix with people. And on one occasion, when we were mixing, um, one of the men there started a conversation with me. He was only sort of chatting, being nice. And he said, um, I hear that you stay, you're from Warsaw, you've come to stay for a little while. And uh, I said, yes. And he said, where do you live in Warsaw? And you know, I, I was so scared and worried that I had forgotten this address that I was supposed to have. And I, I made one up, and it passed. But had this man been from Warsaw himself, had he asked me questions, at that time I hadn't even visited Warsaw. So, you know, we were constantly having little things cropping cropping up and and we were terribly scared of being denounced, um, you know, discovered, uh, betrayed, um, because actually there, were, there was a reward for turning in Jews and it could be quite a lucrative business. So on all counts we were so unhappy. We made the best of it, but my cousin, who was an only child, now I, I don't know whether, I, I don't think I, I told you, I was the middle child of three. My cousin was an only child, and she was so homesick, she couldn't bear it. She really wanted to go home, and she asked to be taken home. 
And they said, we can't take you home yet because the deportations are still going on. And she said, we have very good friends in our hometown who are hiding <coughs> from our valuables. They will take me, please take me to them. And after a little while, they said, OK. And I thought how lucky she was to be back home. And I was still there for what seemed like a terribly long time. And now on my own, not even the, the, sort of the comfort of a cousin with me. Um, eventually, the time came for me to go back. The deportations were over and I was taken back. The arrangements were made that I would meet um, my father in a flour mill where, which before the war belonged to him in partnership with his brother and another man. But now he was lucky to have a job there. So we arrived there and there was my father waiting for me. But there was also my uncle, Joseph Klein, Ija's father. And I, well, he turned white and said, where's my daughter? And I couldn't understand it. I, I, I was shocked. I thought she was so lucky to be back home. And the man said, well, we brought her back and took her to your friends the Machkoviaks, and he said, it was either Machkoviaks or Machayevsky, I can't remember which, but he said, she's not there, where, where is she? And I still remember my uncle vividly pacing up and down, saying, what have you done with my child? And really, that's the end of the story because nobody knows what happened to Ija. She, she just disappeared without a trace. Now my uncle and lots of other, other uncles, my father, were rounded up soon after that and well, a few of them were released but the re they were taken into the local jail. Some were released, the others were taken to the Jewish cemetery and shot. And my uncle, Joseph Klein, was among them. So my aunt had lost her daughter and her husband within a very short um, time. But she survived the war. And her first trial, she was in a, she survived in a concentration camp. She was liberated. Her first priority was to go back to Poland to find her daughter. Well, she, she went to Częstochowa, but those people had fled, they had gone, they weren't there, nobody knew anything about Ija. And we hardly ever talked about Ija because, well, firstly it was too painful, and secondly, neither of us knew what happened. But she knew, my aunt knew a bit more than I did, and I found out that in fact they did go to these very good friends. They collected a suitcase full of valuables and they left with Ija and the suitcase. And on one, one occasion my aunt said to me, how could people do away with a child for the sake of some goods? She said, I would have given them everything I possessed if only they had saved her. And I didn't see my aunt often because we lived in different, um, different countries, but whenever we saw one another, there was always a very warm relationship. And on one occasion, we did take, talk about each other, and she said something that I hesitate to repeat because it is just so, so sad. And she said, my Ija went to the, into the gas chambers by herself. There was nobody to hold her hand. And that's the pain she lived with for the rest <coughs> of her life. Now, at that time, I went back into the ghetto 
And now the ghetto, which originally had 28,000 people, had now been reduced to just 2,400 people. And it was, a, and it was two half streets, so it, it was just a very small area, still very overcrowded for that number of people. And I, I went back into the ghetto with the working party, with my father. And you would think, well, you know, a large group of men going through, a little girl at the side, no one will notice, be easy enough. But it wasn't like that. They were always checking and counting and searching. But at that time, they were actually turning a blind eye because they knew that the people had been in hiding and they were gradually returning. They were sort of surfacing from their holes and they, um, they just let them come back. And after about a week or two, they started rounding them up, the illegals. Now, when I went into the ghetto, my mother and sister were there because they had also been hiding outside. My father and brother had a working permit. So our family, once I returned, our family was still intact. There were five of us. But most families had disappeared altogether. Some of them were reduced to one or two members. And it was a very sorry sight. But as I said, after about one to two weeks, they started rounding up the illegals. And um, on one occasion, they stormed into a room where my mother and sister were, with a lot of other people, and they took everybody away. They took them into this synagogue, and they were doing that day in, day out. They were rounding up more and more people. They were searching for people without working permits who should have been deported. And they were so collecting more people every day, taking them in there. And this was in December, freezing weather conditions. They were held there without any food or water or heating or lighting or sanitary provisions. They were kept in ter under terrible conditions. And they were surrounded by Ukrainian guards with rifles outside. And these guards used to shoot through the windows and injure people or kill them. And they were doing it just for, the, for their amusement. After about um, a week, a week and a half, they marched them out at dawn to the local forest called Rakov. They marched them in groups of 50. And when they got there, they found their graves ready, waiting for them. And they were killed in, in the most horrific way. It was a type of killing that was taking place all over Europe, all over occupied Europe at that time. Um, and it was carried out by the Einsatzgruppen. It, it's a unit of the German army. Now, we know how they were killed because witnesses came to tell us. And it's something I never repeat because I can't bear to do that. But it is very well documented and there, there have been books written about it. There is one particular book called Fabia. It's called Babia because this terrible, um, this terrible massacre took place in Babia, which, which was just outside Kiev. But uh, now it's actually within Kiev because Kiev has expanded. It, it was just an open space, a ravine, a park, and um, there is another. And there's also a book by Christopher Browning 
uh, called Ordinary People. Now, Christopher Browning is an American historian, and his book is called Ordinary People. And he describes who these people were, how they behaved, what they did in great detail. Somebody recommended it to me and I started reading it, but, but I couldn't go on. So this is how I got lost my mother and sister. Now there were still three of us left. And at that time, <coughs> after this happened, there was another relative of mine, an aunt, but not the Klein family. My mother's family was Klein, my father's half god which is my maiden name. Now, my um, aunt, a health god aunt, whose, whose <coughs> husband had been killed with my other uncle and, and other people, she was taken away. She was rounded up, even though she had a working permit. And she was taken away screaming, who will look after my child? She had a five-year-old daughter. And by that time, I was the only female member of the family left. So I looked after and I was 12 and Anne was five. We weren't in that small ghetto very long when the ghetto was liquidated. And when they were liquidating it, I mean, the people with working permits outside, there were just two places of work. There were very large concerns. One was a, a glass um, factory, there's another name for it, I can't think of. And one was a plywood factory, but they weren't just factories, they were very, very large places. And, um, but before they liquidated the ghetto, there were still some illegals that they either hadn't ma managed to find, but of course, I was illegal, so was my little cousin Anne. So they took us, all the illegals, um, outside the barbed wire, and we were in a column, um, and we were being deported, so, but there was one particular German in charge of it. I mean, we were surrounded by soldiers with rifles pointing at us. And it was all very scary because um, whenever there was a deportation, th there was always panic. There were children crying, people being beaten and shot. And um, it was really scary. I was there with my little cousin, and this German officer was, he was in charge. He wa but he wasn't doing anything. He was just standing watching. And I don't know what gave me the idea, but I stepped out of this column. I went up to him and said that I've been separated from my father and brother. They're inside the ghetto. Can I go back to them? And he looked at me flabbergasted that I either had the, the audacity or the courage to um, approach him, but he, he had quite a kindly face and he actually smiled and he called over um, a policeman and said, take her back inside. And on the way, I said, just a minute, I've got to get my cousin. And he said, you can't because she hasn't had permission. And I said, but I, I can't go without her. Anyway, I argued till he finally let me take her back. So we're back inside with my father and brother, the four of us. And um, after that, that ghetto was completely liquidated and there were two groups of people, just over a thousand each. Um, one lot went to the, uh, to the uh, plywood factory, one to the glass um, works, and um, we were lucky that we were we were sent to the same place. And you would think we were still a little family, four of us. But it wasn't like that. Uh, because men and women were always housed separately. So we were at one end of this very um, large compound with, with the women in the barracks, with the women. The men were at the other end. 
so my father was with the, my father and brother was the men, I was with the women. And at that time I started working um, as a slave laborer, I was 12, and my cousin didn't work. She was very small and frail, and um, I could make some comparison with this place and Schindler's List, which everybody knows about that place where people worked and he made sure they were deported and he looked after them. Well, I can say about this place, we're very similar. Um, the, the name actually, which was called Buga before the war, it was now called Dietrich und Fischer, holds work, I mean, um, um, what's the name, works, woodwork. Um, and one could say about him that, well, he, wa he was in some ways good because he turned a blind eye to children. He could have said, no children here because they can't work. But there were a few children. I mean, I by then was working, but there, were, there was my five-year-old cousin and there were some others, uh, perhaps between five and ten, and a few children got away there, just being around. Now conditions got much worse, we were working hard, we had less food, we were living in just barracks, on, on, on all we, we had to our name was just, just a bunk, and even that would be to two people, sometimes three, four, as many as four people to one bunk. The men's were actually four um, tiers, Ours were two tiers in the, in the ladies, in the women's barracks. And um, life was very hard, and um, we were working um, just a very long hours, and had very little food. And we were there not all that long, uh, about sort of approaching two years, between 18 months and two years, when they decided to deport us. And I say, uh, but only the Jews, because there were Christians working there as well, but um, we were not supposed to mix. But of course, we did speak to one another occasionally. Um, so they decided to deport us. They, we walked to the local railway station, um, right through the town, this column of people, with uh, people standing on the side, just looking. I don't know what they thought, um, but I can guess. And um, we were put in onto these uh, cattle trucks. We didn't, we didn't know where we were going, but in fact, the men were deported to a Buchenwald concentration camp and the women to Ravensbrück concentration camp. Now, the, this year's theme on Holocaust Memorial Day was actually uh, journeys. And I, I just want to take a couple of minutes to tell you about this journey because it was quite horrific. It was, the wagons were very overcrowded. We had no food or water, no, no, uh, a bucket in the corner for, for a toilet. And it, it was all very stuffy and people were dying and there were the people who were alive and dead. And the journey went on and on. To me, it seemed like a lifetime. I didn't know how long. But it was only recently that I came across some records which actually tells you how long it was. And it was four and a half days. So that was a four and a half day journey of, of horror. When we arrived at Ravensbrück, the first thing they did is to take everything away from us, whatever we brought, which was not a lot, but everything was taken. Then we had to queue up and give our details. And you know, the Germans were meticulous at record keeping. So there's a full record of it, and I have got some of it, I'll show you on my PowerPoint. Um, 
Then we had to strip and they took our clothing away. They shaved our heads. We went through cold communal showers. And when we came out at the other end, they gave us the concentration camp guard, the um, striped jacket and um, skirt and clogs. They weren't really clogs, they were just some shoes with, with wooden holes, um, soles that was almost impossible to, to walk on in. Um, and when we looked at each other, we couldn't recognize one another. Suddenly we were absolutely not ourselves. We were like all strangers, like uh, shaved heads and stripes. Everybody looked the same. And it had the most terrible effect on us. Um, because when you think about it, who we are and how we look, it's how we dress and how we do our hair. And we're individuals, we all look different, but suddenly we had that, 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 that individuality, the personality taken away from us. It's as if they had taken our very soul and we, we really felt that this is the end. Um, we, we lost hope and without hope there is no chance of survival. Now, in the main camp, it, it was very crowded, but Ravensbrück was a well-organized camp. Everything went according to clockwork. Um, our, um, our rations were half a slice of black bread, not to be mistaken for the nutritious black. Our, and then we had um, soup, something called soup, which was like a grey liquid and something called coffee, which was a brown liquid. And occasionally we got a knob of margarine. Now, some people worked, I didn't work. Um, but our morale by then was so low that people started dying very quickly. My aunt, Franja Klein, died or was on this. I had a couple of aunts on that and friends and relatives and people I knew. Um, my aunt Franja died within uh, three days. My best friend died a few days later. People were just giving up. Now, we weren't there very long, between two and three months, when we were deported again. And this time, after a shorter journey, and I, I don't know how long it was, but I'm sure it's recorded somewhere and I will find it perhaps sooner or later. But it was shorter than the previous journey. We, were, uh, we uh, found ourselves in Bergen-Belsen. Now, has anybody heard of Bergen? I mean, has everybody heard of Bergen-Belsen? I'm sure. Um, and the reason I expect you to have heard is that um, that camp was liberated by the British and for that reason it's, it's uh, you know well documented in this country and uh, there's still people around who um, so in those days when you used to go to the cinema there was always passé news first before the film and uh, when these clips the, the, the um, films started coming back from Belson. Uh, people used to scream out in horror and I actually you know people who told me about it. So we ended up in Belson. When we arrived, um, well, I won't go into detail about, uh, well, we had to get out these big wagons and there were the Germans waiting for us with dogs barking and then sort of prodding us with the rifles saying rouse and we had to sort of jump down from this very high <coughs> truck and um, then we walked to the chemist, quite a long walk. 
And when we arrived there, they didn't have time, they didn't have space to, to take us in. They were terribly overcrowded because at that time, it, it was getting towards the end of the war, not that I knew it then. Um, and as the um, Allies were sort of coming from the east, uh, the, the Germans were actually taking, they're moving all the prisoners further into Germany, moving them west. And somehow, most of them seemed to end up in Bergen-Belsen. Just everybody went to Bergen-Belsen. I read about it even today. It was things I didn't know. And um, the camp was very overcrowded. So they put us up in a very large tent. It was enormous outside the camp. There, there must have been about a thousand people there speaking all different languages and um, uh, from all different countries. And the next day, they took us into the camp. And what we saw, well, what I saw, I'm going to tell you what I saw, defies description. There was a terrible smell, a very foul smell, and a fog. And there were people, but there were skeletons. They were shuffling along aimlessly. And they would just shuffle along and they would just collapse and die. You could be speaking to someone and they would die in front of you. Um, there were just people dying everywhere, so there were dead bodies everywhere. And there were piles of bodies, piles of naked, twisted, decaying bodies. It was the most horrible sight. Um, we were allocated to, to a barracks which uh, was terribly overcrowded and some of them that should have had about 80 to 100 people had hundreds of people. Well, it's recorded that some of them had a thousand people. But even though I was there, I, I can hardly believe that it was actually a thousand. But they were terribly, terribly overcrowded. Um, now, when we got in there, um, I heard that there was a children's um, home somewhere in the camp. And I set out to find it. We were interviewed by a sister Luba and her doctor Binko. And after they sort of asked us some questions, they turned to me and said, we are also very overcrowded, but in any case, you are too old, they pointed at me. And um, I said, okay, I understand, but will you take my cousin? You can see how small and frail she is. And they said, yes, but Anne would not leave me. She was so attached to me, she was so terrified of losing me, having lost her mother that she wouldn't let me out of her sight. Well, except when I was working and she, she had no choice about that. But she wouldn't stay in the, in the home without me. Anyway, it's quite a long story, but eventually they took us both in and um, we were very lucky. It was just a bit of really good luck because although the uh, children's home didn't really have much much food either, because at that time everything, the place was just um, becoming um, a bit chaotic because the journey, it was so close to the end, it was just a matter of a couple of months, perhaps two or three months before the war was finished. And um, we, we got into there, now th this, um, home was actually, there were Dutch children there, a group of Dutch children, with a very special history of their own, but I don't have time to tell you about it, because they're there on their own, they had arrived with their parents, but they, all sorts of different things happened to their parents, and they, they were rescued, and it, it, it's a very interesting story. Now, although the conditions were marginally better, 
Um, some of us still succumbed to typhus. The, the whole camp had so many epidemics <coughs> raging that um, you know, people were just dying. There, there, were, there was every kind of illness, epidemics, in, 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 contagious diseases, everything you can imagine. And there was no medication. There wasn't even any clean water. And the reason we were that much better off in, the, in this home, we didn't actually have much more food. But the people who looked after us, we called them nurses, well, sisters, actually, not nursing sisters, but they were not. They were not qualified nurses. But they were just looking after us. The fact that we had actually someone caring for us, even though they couldn't give us much more food, although they used to go to the kitchens and beg for a little more food for the children. So they, um, you know, it made all the difference just having an adult in, in charge of us. And even with all this uh, extra little advantage, um, I still um, got typhus. And I remember lying on my bunk, my upper bunk, uh, and I had sort of got over the worst because I'd been unconscious and I don't know what even, but um, I know that I, I knew what was going on. I was looking out the window, my bunk was by the window. And I saw people running. And I thought, you know, I saw them running to the gate. I didn't know why. But the only thing that occupied my mind was how have they got the strength to run? And that was the 15th of April, 1945, when the camp was liberated by the British. And I'll stop here just to show you the rest of my PowerPoint. Um, now, this is my father. <coughs> And I want you to know that when I was liberated, I had nothing. I only had the concentration camp girl I was standing up in. I certainly didn't have family photographs. We had lost everything. But my brother was the only other survivor of my, family, my immediate family. Um, managed to find some abroad, for, you know, with, that were with friends and relatives. So I have got just a few photographs. And, and this, I think, must be a passport photograph of my father. Um, and this is one of my mother. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, this is a photo <coughs> she sent to her cousin in Palestine before the war. This is a family photo. and. Um, I am sitting just down there on the left hand side at the bottom, that's me and my brother is above me and my mother is second from the left <coughs> and my aunt is holding um, my cousin Ija and there's my uncle and my other aunt and most and there's my in the middle is my aunt Franja Klein who died in Ravensbrück very quickly and so it's just a small family photograph. Um, this is one with my grandfather. I am in the middle with that big uh, bone in my head uh, sitting there with my hand under my chin. Uh, and my grandfather was his white beard and a very smiling, real father Christmas face. I think all he needs is the hat. Um, and uh, this one is just to show you that we did have bone in our um, in our town, but they made it so quickly. There were lots of casualties and there was, there was lots of bomb property, but they came in very quickly. It, it didn't last because Poland was so unprepared for this war that within two weeks they had invaded right through. Um, now, these are the um, the notices I mentioned to you during my talk. The one on the left is in German, on the right in Polish. And it tells you along there, sort of towards about a th three quarters of the way down, uh, or two thirds of the way down, 
um, what to hand in and by, by what date and at what address and, and at what time and so on. So they were gradually depriving us of everything. Um, the next one is my cousin Ija, who disappeared without, without uh, any sign. Um, <coughs> Now, I think she's coming from, from a library carrying a big book. She's got her school bearer with a school badge on. Um, this is my cousin Anne, who survived the war. Um, she was seven and I was 14 at the end of the war. And I'm just trying to assess how long it takes for hair to grow that length because her head was also shaved. And uh, we were actually sent to Sweden with, with a group of children four months after the war in July 1945. And this must have been about a year or 18 months later. Um, and this is a list that I, I just uh, mentioned it briefly when I spoke. Um, it's a list of the last women, uh, last Jewish women being deported from Piotrkov <coughs> to Ravensbrück. And my name is on it. And my friend found it on the web. And I, I, I was amazed. And I said to him, how he, he was doing some research and he came across this list. And I said, how enterprising, how wonderful, that, amazing that you found this list. And he said, enterprising, he said, I know your story, but to actually see your name on the original document on that list is something that left me in tears. And I can, and the next one is a close-up. And if you look, the third down from the top, Helf got Mala. And the one below is Helf got Hanya, my cousin Anne. And below that, by chance, it's my aunt, Klein Franja, who died in Ravensbrück very quickly. And, um, there are lots of friends and relatives on that list, but I just want you to have a look. If you look at cross, you look at my age, and it is down as 16. Now somebody, it was a teacher that pointed it out to me. I hadn't even noticed it myself. I was just so overawed seeing it. I didn't examine it. But um, now why would my age be 16 on there? and not 14, which was, I was 14 when I was in Ravensbrück. I was 14 when I was liberated. So why would it be 16 there? Any ideas? No? It's very simple. If you were older, you had more chance of survival because if a 16 year old, they might choose for work but they wouldn't have 14 year old. Now, you know, sometimes they were actually choosing people from lists rather than on the spot. Because you've heard about these selections when people arrived in Auschwitz and it was like children one way, old people same way, and then people that they could use for work to the other side. Now, so everybody wanted to be able to have that privilege of working. Um, and they, well, a lot of people did give their false ages. I mean, some people made themselves younger because they wouldn't tolerate old, old people either. And very often, when there was just one person, one child left on their own, say a 15 year old, an 18 year old, and they didn't have the benefit of advice from perhaps a relative or their parents. The people behind them would say, when you come up to the top, say you're 18 and that you're a carpenter or whatever. And that was one way of trying to save one's life. 
And this is just one example of what was happening. But, and it's quite well known, but the fact is that I've got it in writing on the original document that it's there. So this is what people were doing. Um, this is only to show you the journey from Robert, from Kelpsburg to Ravensburg, which is a very long way, and difficult to assess on here, but that's the four and a half day of the journey. And th this is um, just um, plan of the camp, and there were so many camps. There was a prison camp, two star camp, neutral camp, isolation hut, special camp, Hungarian camp, prison camp, and so on and so forth. Now, these camps were actually divided by barbed wire. And I remember when we arrived there, so lots of people did that, and I did it myself, we would go up to this barbed wire to speak pe to people on the other side. It, and if, for instance, I remember speaking to men, there was a men's camp on the other side of the barbed wire. And I asked, which town do you come from? And if they happened to come from my town, I would say, well, did you see my father or my brother? So people were constantly searching, even before the war ended, because people were scattered, families, even those that survived. They all ended up in different, in different camps, in different parts of the world, and some of them only found one another after many years, as many as 50 in one case. Um, now the next one is just a shorter journey. This is the, just a picture of Belson and another picture, and this is actually the children's hut or barracks, whichever you want to call it. And here is Kramer being, um, he's being arrested by the British. Uh, he was a ca camp commandant. And before he was a commandant of bergen belsen he was a commandant of Auschwitz. Um, here the camp's going up in smoke because um, unlike other camps, they didn't want to preserve anything because it was all so contaminated. And this is the first memorial that went up after the war. And this, the saddest one of all for me, because this is the memorial in Rakov, the forest. Now, when the first Jews returned to Piotrkov, they arranged for the remains of um, the people killed in Rakhov Forest to be exhumed and buried in the Jewish cemetery according to Jewish rites. And this memorial is actually in Rakhov Forest and it went up in, within the last 10 years. It is the council that put it up. And it's just a mem memorial, as you know, nobody's there. And, um, now this is a close-up and it reads in everlasting memory 560 innocent jews were murdered here by the nazis on december 20th 1942. now i just want you to think about the date the 20th of december these people who committed this this the atrocities, these terrible murders. Four days later, they were back with their families, enjoying and celebrating Christmas Eve. Now, what sort of minds does that take? I think the, these people will be studied till the end of time. To will never know what 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 it takes to behave in this way and, and to act like that. And, and it's something that we'll, we'll go on asking. Um, now, the, 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 the inscription below the one that I read out to you says, in sacred memory, 39 Jewish children were murdered here by the Nazis in July 1943. It says, in sadness and sorrow, forever in our hearts. Now, these children, I didn't know about that, and that happened later. But I came across, not a big book, just a small booklet, 
where it describes how these children were killed. And it, it is just so unbelievable that they could behave like that to children, any children, or oh, it just uh, beggars belief. So this is the end of my PowerPoint, the end of my talk, and um, you're welcome to ask any questions. Um, thank you very much.